With a recent resurgence in the interest for Junji Ito, a man who some consider to be the father of modern horror manga, we thought it only fitting to take a second look at one of his landmark projects. As you might know, this year Adult Swim has produced and is airing a fully-fledged animated adaptation of Ito's now-classic project Uzumaki. We would love to take a look at that show, but more than likely we will need some time to digest that one. In the meantime, let's jump back two decades to the original adaptation of Uzumaki, the 2000 film directed by elusive, reclusive madman Higuchinsky. To understand Uzumaki, we need to go back before the film, and first understand the project's father, Junji Ito. Ito at this point in history is known as the father of modern horror manga. He definitely wasn't the first to make a living working in this genre, but he was the man to catapult it onto the international stage in the 90s and 2000s, with titles like Tomie, Gyo, and the basis of today's film, Uzumaki, as well as a number of other well-loved short stories like The Enigma of Amigara Fault. Born in 1963, Ito began producing his horror manga in the late 1980s, drawing inspiration from a number of notable mangaka that he had grown up with, as well as works of H.P. Lovecraft. You'll notice, if you delve into Ito's works, that Lovecraft's cosmic horror plays a huge part in some of his stories. The other, perhaps more prevalent theme of his horror manga, though, is that of body horror, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's the type of horror that involves anything that could haunt you regarding your body. Sudden growths, infestations, implosion, explosion, you name it, Junji Ito's probably done it. This, as with many of his manga, is a central part of Uzumaki, which you'll see today with the film adaptation. Uzumaki, which was originally published in the manga magazine Big Comic Spirits in 1998 and 1999, centers around a small town known as Kurozucho, whose citizenry become obsessed with spirals in all of their varying forms, whether natural or man-made. The story is told in a loosely linked anthology structure for the majority of the manga, with each chapter concerning a different group of people, all being described by the same single narrator, who ties it all together in a linear fashion. The last quarter or so of the manga, on the other hand, brings the narrator into the limelight as the true main character, and follows a more continuous plot as a result. It's an odd structure, but allows for a lot of world building, and it's honestly just a fantastic read with simply grotesque artwork. Check it out if you haven't, as it's easily available in English, and it's only 20 chapters in length, including the 19 serialized segments and one additional chapter composed to celebrate the film's release. Uzumaki was Junji Ito's third manga to be adapted for film, after the first three Tomie films and the TV movie Long Dream. This period was definitely a boom in terms of his popularity, as all of these films were released in the span of only two years. Long Dream, in fact, shared its director with today's subject. Uzumaki was co-written by Kengo Kaji, who is best known as the lead writer on Tokyo Gore Police, Chika Yasuo, who has no other credits to her name, and Takao Nita. The film was directed by Akihiro Higuchi, an ethnically Japanese man born in Ukraine, who is typically credited under the pseudonym Higuchinsky or, more recently, Andrei Higujinsky. His only other directorial film credits are the aforementioned Long Dream and 2003's Tokyo 10 Plus One. Prior even to Uzumaki, though, Higujinsky's sole credit was directing an episode of the series Echo Echo Azarak, another manga adaptation which concerned witches and black magic. More recently, Higujinsky has taken to directing music videos and prolifically producing photography. Honestly, not much can be found, at least in English, about Hijuchinsky's life story prior to the production of Uzumaki, nor afterward for that matter. We don't mean to gloss over it, there's just not much about him as far as we can tell. This is intentional, as you may know if you've heard of Hijuchinsky before. He's a notoriously reclusive director, bursting onto the scene and leaving it just as abruptly. There are barely any, if any, pictures of him that can be confirmed to be authentic. He's something of an outsider artist, if anything, especially compared to everyone else we've covered on the show thus far, meaning that he wasn't someone who necessarily went through the typical process of becoming a director. This makes Uzumaki pretty stand out, as it's relatively untouched by external influences beside the source material. 
According to the World Cinema Directory, fan attempts to find him after his disappearance from the film industry have turned up information about Hijuchinsky more recently working on directing concert films alongside his photographic efforts. This film and the new Adult Swim show were not the only adaptation of Ito's Uzumaki though, with two video games being produced for the Wonder Swan, a handheld game console that never made it out of Japan officially, and which was the last console Gunpei Yokoi, the father of the Game Boy, helped to create prior to his death. One of the games is a visual novel which fairly closely follows the manga in terms of plot and art style. The visual novel is a genre which has really only become popular in the West in recent years in which players interact with their environment in a set number of ways. It's something like a choose-your-own-adventure book, hence the name of the genre. The other game, meanwhile, is a simulation game, where the player can watch and control the events occurring in Kurozucho. The objective here is to spread the obsession with spirals throughout the town in order to consume its citizenry with madness. The film was released in Japan and America at the same time, albeit on a smaller number of screens in America. This was in an attempt to drum up interest via word of mouth on the internet. Longtime viewers of the show will know that the early 2000s provided a fantastic environment online for people interested in the burgeoning foreign film market to find the strangest and most standout films they wouldn't have been able to see earlier. In this way, the distributors were ahead of their time in marketing the film, as it helped to carry Uzumaki into the present day as a modern classic Japanese horror film in the minds of critics, alongside Ringu, Cure, and Juon. Longtime viewers will also not be surprised to learn that Omega Project had a hand in Uzumaki, Omega being an assistant production company who also helped with Ichi the Killer, Audition, Suicide Club, and several other major films of the period. What's more, Omega Mikot, another Omega company, helped produce the two Uzumaki games for The Wonder Swan. IMDb states that the 2000 adaptation of Uzumaki was in production before Ito's manga finished its run, meaning that while both projects begin in the same place, they end up at completely different endings. To its credit, the film does cram in a lot of the spicier images from the manga, though the film has long been noted as inferior thanks to it not delving as deeply into the implications or more complicated aspects of the source material. The film is still notable in spite of this criticism, however, and we believe it to be worth a look even all of these years later. Uzumaki follows several young people in the small, sleepy town of Koruzocho. Primarily, we have Kirie, the young woman who provides the film's opening narration, and through whose eyes we see many of the supernatural occurrences around town. Then there's Shuichi, her childhood friend who goes to school in the next town over. There's also Kirie's father, her mother and her classmates, as well as Shuichi's father, the first victim of the events of Koruzocho. Little by little, the town gets overtaken by a shared growing obsession with spirals, or as they're known, uzumaki in Japanese. Shuichi's father collects as many spirals as he can find, hoarding them within his house and going as far as to refuse any food not containing spirals. Kirige's father, a potter, is commissioned by Shuichi's dad to complete a spiral piece, setting him off on his own downward spiral. Shuichi's mother enters a state of psychosis after seeing spiral cremation smoke. The same fate befalls a number of other students and adults as well, with the entirety of Kurozucho growing obsessed with spirals in a number of unique and alarming ways. Beyond understanding the context and the text of Uzumaki, we have a bit more that can be gleaned from digging deeper into the film. The spiral, perhaps due to being such a relatively simple shape, has a multitude of meanings across different cultures. It's something that appears in mathematics, nature, human biology, ancient works, the cosmos. It's something that has fascinated people for generations, though perhaps not to the hyperbolic extent that the characters of Uzumaki become obsessed. The spiral is the basis of a number of mystical and religious symbols too, from the yin and yang to the Celtic triskel to iconography from any number of ancient civilizations and modern religions. Looking at the spiral from a specifically Japanese perspective, we can observe the tomoe, which appears more so as a swirling whirlpool than a true spiral. The tomoe is an ancient symbol of Japan, appearing inside and outside of Shinto, Japan's primary indigenous religion. 
In pairs, the tomoe can represent balance, similar to the yin and yang. In threes, it can be seen to represent the three phases of the world in Shinto mythology, those being the realm of the gods, the earth, and the underworld. It can also represent triple groupings of gods. Japanese mythology has a lot of threes in it, you might find. Important to note is that the tomoe is also seen as the symbol of the god Hachiman, the god of war. During the reign of the Shogun, the military leader of Japan who held de facto power in the country for almost 700 years, many samurai adapted the symbol for this reason. Additionally, the tomoe is so pervasive that many families and companies still use it in their logos and mon, or family emblems. Fast forwarding to modern pop culture, the sequel to the novel Ring, from which the series of films sprung, is the extension of a ring, being named Rasen, another word for spiral with the third novel being titled Loop, a different type of endless circle. In doing research about the uzumaki, or spiral, and trying to discern its meaning within Japanese culture, we found it actually pretty difficult to find specific information on the origins of this symbol. While we did find some historical information about the tomoe, the uzumaki, or rasen itself seems to be a little more abstract perhaps because it's a more basic symbol, and could thus occur from such an earlier point than the tomoe. There's a lot to talk about that we found, about how the tomoe resembles certain Korean, pagan, and Celtic symbols. But there's barely anything about how the spiral itself, a more simplified tomoe in a way, is so pervasive in art worldwide. In the film itself, the only indication we're given about symbolism regards a mirror that is present at the suicide of Shuichi's father. Tamara talks about the words for mirror and serpent being written differently, but having the same readings, which indicates the idea that the Ouroboros, or the serpent biting its own tail, another endless symbol, is embodied in the mirror, or perhaps the self reflected therein. Other than this though, we're not given any hints as to what the spiral might actually mean. And this is the brilliance of Uzumaki. Throughout the film, we are constantly bombarded by spirals, though they're not immediately apparent. Almost every scene has at least one tucked away somewhere in the frame, while Ito, with the original manga, took the more cosmic approach to its horror, injecting the idea of the spiral into everything within the small town of Kurozocho. Higuchinsky instead takes advantage of the medium of the moving image to manifest this more directly. Throughout the runtime of the film, the audience gets the feeling that neither they nor the characters can escape the Uzumaki. It induces a sense of unease that may not be wholly conscious, and it's unlikely that anyone will see every spiral on their first viewing of the film. Adding to this is the color palette of the film. There's a very distinct green atmosphere, with the marked exception of several parts involving the television crew or other electronics which seem extremely colorful and bright compared to the rest of the film. This lends to the movie a timeless atmosphere, which makes it feel both older and newer than its 2000 release date. It feels like it could have been created at any point, the perfect feeling for something that is supposed to represent a spiral, which, as long as it spins, has no true end. Compound this with the fact that the film begins and ends at the same moment, and you've pretty much got an endless loop leaving viewers to draw their own conclusions about Uzumaki's cyclical nature. Let's talk about the film as an adaptation. We don't want anyone getting the wrong idea and thinking that we dislike the body horror present in the manga, or that we believe it to be non-atmospheric or ineffective with its scares. Quite the opposite, actually. The manga is pretty brilliant. We read it ahead of time so that we could go into the film with some background knowledge of the manga. What we're trying to get at here is not that the film is bad, but that in adapting the manga to film, Hijuchinsky and the screenwriters made the sly decision to restrain themselves. Sort of like how the Suicide Club manga is a bit more balls to the wall in terms of showing some racier parts. Junji Ito's original manga benefits from being in a non-photorealistic style. It's all hand-drawn. On the other hand, the medium of film, save of course animated film, can suffer from needing to be more realistic. Body horror is particularly difficult in this respect, as the effects need to be up to a certain bar, or else they need to embrace their insanity in a way that allows the audience to remove themselves from the reality of the situation. This is pretty difficult to do, as failing this will more than likely lead to laughter, where the filmmakers might have sought cringes and bothered sharp inhales from the audience. In this way, Uzumaki walks the line effectively, 
showing only what won't look absolutely absurd, keeping in the transformations and deaths that are easier to simulate realistically, and slowly ramping up the body horror to a thunderous crescendo at the end, once the audience has bought into the insanity of the world enough to believe something a little more crazy. If we can complain about anything with the adaptation, though, it would be the relative dearth of material compared to the manga. If anything, we kind of wish we had watched the film before reading the manga. About two-thirds of the way through the film, we were discussing that we liked how they had restructured things for a more interwoven narrative rather than the episodic one present in the manga. But we kept questioning how much they could pack in. In the end, the film is composed primarily of plots derived from chapters 1, 2, and 7, with smaller parts drawn from chapters 4, 6, 8, 15, and 19. If we're being generous, that means that the film adapts less than half the manga. But given how truncated the latter chapters listed here become, it's really something more like one-fifth of the manga that makes it into the film. The film isn't bad by any means, but we couldn't help thinking after finishing it that the manga would perhaps be better suited to adaptation as a horror series, or perhaps a series of films like Ito's other big manga-to-film adaptation, Tomie. Ultimately, these losses that come from Uzumaki's adaptation to film mean that the message of the film perhaps changes. We won't spoil anything about the manga, as it really gets pretty far out there compared to the film. It's just something you have to experience for yourself, but it's interesting to see how the type of horror transforms the whole project. In the manga, we can see a lot more of the cosmic horror for which Junji Ito drew upon the works of H.P. Lovecraft. He's able to explore the psychosis of the town in as much detail as he wants, simply given the long-form storytelling nature of the manga medium. The question keeps coming up, what exactly is the Uzumaki? Why is the spiral infecting this town? We're given hints throughout as to its possible origin, but there are never any straightforward answers. It also takes on something of a social commentary, questioning, if people could not escape Kurozucho, what would they do? In the film, however, the question becomes simply, why is any of this happening? It makes us question the nature of the spiral, but it never heavily touches on the social commentary aspects of the manga. The story, given its shortened length, doesn't allow us to explore the depths of madness presented through being trapped that the manga later explores. It then becomes a slow burn horror film, which gradually ramps up to its climax, leaving you bamboozled as to why this pervasive symbol has plunged Kurozocho into madness and whether it could infect you as well, given that it is inside you and all around you. It's something of a baffling watch, but we definitely recommend Uzumaki if you're looking for something which is a breeze, which will put you on edge and make you question just what the heck is going on. If you're looking for something deeper that seems to have its own set of morals, check out the manga. If you don't like those damn words on pages though, the film is its own interesting case study in outsider art through film, mysterious symbolism, and the nature of panic via body horror. At some point, we might cover Adult Swim's more recent adaptation of the manga. In the meantime, let us know in the comments what you think of Higujinski's film, the anime, and the manga.